for joining us this evening on this lovely day. We are moving towards summer. Very exciting. Hopefully you all had a chance to see the exhibition next door. Um, Henri Gaudier-Bresca, New Rhythms, Art, Dance and Movement in London, 1911 to 1915. Um, if you haven't, we'll open the galleries this evening so you'll have a chance to look around. Um, my name's Jenny, I'm the Senior Curator at Kettle's Yard. I'm just going to do a few notes of introduction then we'll get, we'll get on with it. But um, just so you know, the fire exit is the door that you came in through and please could you make sure that your mobiles are turned off. Um, the sort of inspiration for the exhibition next door was primarily uh, our two dancer sculptures from 1913. But immediately when we started to conceive of the exhibition, we wanted to broaden that out to think about movement and rhythm in Gaudier's work much more widely. And there were few subjects to which Gaudier sort of returned more than once in his work. Um, his dancers were one, and wrestlers was another. But it wasn't just wrestling, he was also interested in lots of other sports, including sword fighting, there's a lovely sketch upstairs of sword fighters, and boxing. And of course, those of you who've seen the show know that there is a wonderful um, poster, three foot poster of the boxers next door. So we wanted to have an event this evening that could sort of explore that subject more broadly. And we've got three wonderful speakers, Dr. Sarah Victoria Turner, and Stephen Fowler, and the event this evening is going to be chaired by Professor Linda Mead. And Linda is going to introduce Sarah and Stephen properly in a moment. Um, but just to say something about Lynn, Linda, um, I don't think you really need an introduction, but um, Lynn's work is incredibly um, expansive in lots of different areas, but she's written um, around um, Victorian femininity, the visual culture of the metropolis, um, obscenity and um, in Victorian culture and visual culture, and also around painting, photography and film um, at the turn of the century and around 1900. She's produced some amazing books, so if you haven't read these, then go to the shop and buy them, including The Female Nude, which was um, 1992. Yeah, and um, um, which is no. a, a sort of core seminal it's text. It's very relevant. Still. It is still. And um, more recently, in 2008, The Haunted Gallery of Painting, Photography and Film, around 1900, which is fantastic. Piece. And at the moment, she's working on the post-war um, era, so post-war British visual culture, on a book called The Tiger in the Smoke, so, which is very exciting. Um, but the reason that Lynn is ch chairing the session today is because she's also done a great deal of research around boxing and boxing in visual culture um, and in art. So um, I'm really delighted that she's here today. Um, in terms of timings, we are going to keep it quite tight and hopefully give you a chance to ask some questions and have some discussion. So the first about 25 minutes, Sarah will present um, a short sort of talk around Godier's wrestlers. Um, Sarah is an author for our wonderful catalogue, which is also an on sale still in the shop, if you would like to purchase it later. Um, and then we will pass over to Stephen, who is an artist, poet, writer, everything, um, but he's also um, a wrestler and um, Stephen has um, done a lot of work around the subject and also worked on a wonderful collaborative project with Sarah um, for Tate a number of years ago, so he's going to be talking about that experience and about wrestling as a sport itself. And then we will have around a 20 to 25 minute discussion which Linda will chair and you're welcome to ask questions and please do get involved in the discussion. And then about 7.10, we'll go through the learning studio into the gallery. We'll serve some wine. And at about 7.30, we will have a, I don't want to say recital, a reading um, in front of the wrestler's relief in the final um, space in the exhibition, which is Stephen's original prose. So I hope it will be a lively evening. And as I say, please do ask questions when we come to that moment. Um, I think that's all from me, so yeah, I'll just, I'll hand over to you. In case you were wondering what you were looking at while you were sitting there, that was me indulging my post-war interests. It's a, a wrestling scene from this amazing film by Jules Dessin, Night in the City, uh, made in 1950, a wonderful film noir. So um, if any of you uh, want to see the rest of it, um, it's... Uh, 
BFI DVD. Um, the reason why I thought it would be good to have it um, while you came in was just as an instance of the way in which wrestling and combat sports has an ongoing history of representation within the visual arts, which is what we're going to be talking about tonight. And we're going to start straight away by introducing Dr. Sarah Victoria Turner. And Sarah is Assistant Director for Research at the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art in London. Um, before that, she was lecturer in the history of art uh, at the University of York, and her research focuses on art and visual culture in Britain and the British Empire from about 1800 to 1950. And she started working on Godier when uh, completing her MA in Sculpture Studies at Leeds and at the Henry Moore Institute. And I'll just introduce you, I think Jenny has already, um, to Stephen Fowler, who, as Jenny said, is a poet, artist, and curator, and who works um, in the modernist and avant-garde traditions. And he's published seven collections of poetry, you'll hear some later. And he's been commissioned by Tate Britain, the British Council, Tate Modern, and many others. But now I'll hand over straight away to Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for the introductions and for the invitation to speak uh, this evening. I want to start straight away um, with this incredible relief sculpture. Um, the Wrestlers by Godia Breshka. It's one of the centrepieces of the exhibition, and it's really been at the centre of my thinking about the intersections between wrestling and art in the 19th and early 20th century. The version at Kettle's Yard is one of uh, nine cuffs that um, Jim Mead had made uh, from the Plaster original. And that original was made by Godier in his London studio sometime between 1913 and 14. The dating is a little bit indeterminate, and that makes it fun actually thinking about this piece of uh, this sculpture within a series of images of wrestling and wrestlers, um, which are so beautifully displayed in this show. Godier became fascinated, even obsessed, we might say, by wrestling in the period between 1912 and his death in, in 1915, and as many of you know, he died fighting in the First World War. This piece, the plaster relief, was made on the back of another piece of art. His friend, uh, the artist Horace Brodsky, uh, recounts a story um, in his rather pugnacious autobiography, actually. <laughs> These memoirs actually often have the, uh, this, the sort of uh, texture of, a, of, a, of fighting and of grappling themselves. So his, his friend, Horace Brodsky, recounts going to see um, Godier in his studio and seeing Godier getting kind of rather um, disgruntled about a painting he's made of um, a, white, uh, a white chapel, um, a, a Jewish fruit seller in Whitechapel. So apparently he turns over this oil painting, puts it on stretchers, and uses that as the ground for this plaster relief, which he then starts to build up the plaster mat, we might think about it, and then into that carves the wrestlers into his plaster ground. He makes, making this incredible knot of tangled limbs and forms, almost breaking down at some point. It's quite hard to think about where one body ends and one body begins. I'm trying not to fall over the wires, but particularly in this part over here, where the limbs and the arms really uh, tangle. But the, the relief stayed in Godier's studio, and it was never exhibited in his lifetime. The first time it left the studio uh, to be exhibited was at the Memorial Exhibition at the Leicester Galleries in London in 1918. So it really was a studio piece of work, and I think in that way, um, again, we don't know so much about who Godier was making it for, was it a commission? 
I have a feeling it came out of discussions he was having with his collaborator and friend, the poet Ezra Pound, and also other group, other artists in his avant-garde network in London, such as Wyndham Lewis. But again, we don't know so much. The first time I say we know it was exhibited was at this memorial exhibition after his death. So I think this idea of experimenting with form, experimenting with the physicality of the body, this is something that the subject and theme of wrestling really provided Godio with a kind of forum for thinking about these relationships. As I said, this work was one of many and that he made on the subject of wrestling. I mentioned his friend, the artist Brodsky, Horace Brodsky before, and, and Godia saw Brodsky cut, cutting a lino cut um, in Brodsky's studio, and Godia decided to turn his wrestler's uh, relief into um, a lino cut for his Christmas card. And I'm sure many of us here would have loved to have had a wrestling uh, Christmas card. And so this is uh, Godi's only uh, lino cut that he experimented uh, with during his short but very productive career. And here I think again we can really explore those visual relationships between two bodies in proximity that really threaten to destabilise physical boundaries between those figures. We've got the wrestler's tray of 1913, um, a commission from Roger Fry's Amiga workshop. And again, we can really see these kind of blocks and forms being put into juxtaposition with we, each other. Again, you really have to look hard to see where these bodies are. And it's much easier in the tray, so perhaps we can go and have a look together to really explore those formal and aesthetic uh, relationships that Godia was playing with here. There are also about 10 drawings, pencil and pen and ink drawings, that relate um, to the subject um, of wrestling. And I think there are probably a lot more, but quite a few of Godier's drawings um, disappeared shortly after his death, or it's quite hard to find uh, some of them. And in 1912, Godier enrolled in a, a life class in Chelsea. Um, he hadn't been to art school, so this was his first encounter with a uh, drawing from life models and he describes um, at one um, of the um, life classes that he went to seeing recognizing um, a wrestler that he'd seen in a gym and he makes this um, rapid but quite um, observant and precise sketch of the contours of the body, and I think especially in the relief as well, the idea of contour is really important. Those again, those boundaries of, of physicality and, and, and the figure. And here you can see him tracing those bulging muscles of the thighs, the knees, moving up through the torso. And again, we're starting to get this idea of energy, of vitality, and force. The, the viewer here, we have to kind of picture the next moment. And he wrote to his, um, in a letter to his partner, Sophie Breschka, describing um, this life model and wrestler that he was drawing from as a figure who was strong, taut, and finely square. So already, I think, thinking about the shapes of the bodies of these trained um, athletes as well. In these live classes, he would draw between 150 and 200 drawings per night. And again, there's something about the incredible energy of, of, of drawing and making art that Godia really, I think, brought together and put in, his, um, in, in these works that concentrate on sport and the physical uh, body. And here is another sculpture of, uh, called The Wrestlers, or The Wrestler, sorry, of 1912. And this was a commissioned um, work um, from an engineer called Charles, um, Charles Wheeler. And Charles Wheeler was an avid sports fan and commissioned Godier to make some statue, what he called statuettes uh, for him. Um, Godier wrote that he'd been commissioned to make two little statues in plaster, one of a wrestler and the other of a bather, which Charles, will, Charles Wheeler will have cast in bronze by one of his firms. He also had these uh, links with engineering firms. We don't have a copy or an extant version of the bather, but we do have um, the wrestler here. And I think, again, you can start to see these connections between the drawings 
um, and the sculptures as well. I'm very interested in that relationship. I'm not sure that all the drawings were preparatory sketches for the sculpture. I think actually some of the drawings came after the sculptures and this very interesting interrelationship with the sketches and the sculpture that I don't think is a sort of straight um, linear relationship which takes us from preparatory sketch to finished sculpture. I think there's a lot more fluid um, relationships going on here as Godi is really exploring the physicality of the wrestling uh, match. In preparation to um, complete his um, wrestler figure for Charles Wheeler, Godi went um, to some wrestling uh, gyms in London and he wrote to Sophie saying, I'm going to see wrestling in the evenings two or three times a week, which will give me some good sketches. I'm also going to see some boxing matches and diving, and I'm terribly excited about it. So there's a real, I mean, this sort of sense of excitement at the energy, that sort of the temperature of watching um, these, these matches is something that really comes through in the letters that he writes um, to Sophie when he's watching uh, or describing his encounters at the wrestling uh, gym. The art historian um, Evelyn Silver has uh, ascertained that t the venue exactly where Godi Abreshka went to um, to see uh, these wrestlers in the gym, and it was the Re London Wrestling Club, just off Fleet Street, so pretty central uh, place, and it was also the headquarters of the London Amateur Wrestling Society. And one thing I've really enjoyed about this project um, and thinking about uh, Godia's interest in wrestling is the places it's taken me as well, trying to find these wrestling gyms, talking to lots of people about the cultures of Edwardian wrestling, actually, trying to think about that landscape of, of the gymnasium and the wrestling match that Godi was really um, sort of embedding in himself in and enjoying the spectacle of watching these bodies and looking um, at the incredible visual culture and periodical culture that wrestling and fighting produced. Um, some wonderful um, magazines, Health and Strength being one of them, and, and I found this um, article on the London Amateur Wrestling Society, um, and, and this, was, um, this came out in February 1913, just two months actually after Godier had been to visit uh, the gym. And it's, it's kind of interesting to think about whether some of these uh, athletes shown in these poses um, on the, on the, in the photograph here might have been some of the um, athletes um, that um, Godier was looking at when he went to see them. And it's really lovely that you have the letter that he wrote to Sophie, um, his partner, after he's visited um, the gym and you can look again at this, the way that he um, inserts this sketch into his letter when he's describing the visit in quite a state of some excitement about what he'd seen um, and sort of sketches this series of, of quite incredible moves, perhaps Steve is going to say more about this, sort of hurtling through the air and again that vitality, that energy, that dynamism, that is again thinking about the, perhaps some of the gaps between reality and representation, um, the, what, what you know, the artistic imagination is doing, uh, Godi's imagination is doing when he's thinking and reporting back on these scenes. I think it's just worth thinking about this, uh, this uh, letter. God, I've seldom seen anything so lovely. Two athletic types, large shoulders, tall, big necks like bowls. Small in the build, with firm thighs and slender ankles. Feet sensitive as hands and not tall. They fought with amazing vivacity and spirit, turning in the air, falling back on their heads, and in a flash were up again on the other side, utterly incomprehensible. They have reached such a state of perfection that one can take the other by a foot and without exaggeration can whirl him five times round and round himself. We'll be asking the volunteers later to try that out. <laughs> and then let go so the other flies off like a ball and falls on his head. But he is up in a moment and back again, more ferocious than ever to the fight. I thought he'd be smashed to bits. I stayed and I drew for two hours and I'm going to begin the statuettes on Sunday. So I think that kind of idea again of the encounter 
um, with these figures really comes across. And thinking about the wrestler's relief, perhaps as a fusion of his encounters with wrestlers training in the gym and the life class as well, and bringing those experiences uh, together. The early 20th century was a moment of, I think, revival for wrestling, um, and it was widely reported on in the periodical press, the national press as well. I'm just showing you um, a, an image here from the London Illustrated News, um, a, a bit earlier, 1904, but um, thinking there was a lot of discussion then about a revival, an Edwardian golden age um, of, of this sport as well. And I think wrestlers at this point were worldwide celebrities a lot of them, who would travel, there was global competitions as well, so this was a, a global sport with a global audience, and um, people like George Hackett Schmidt, um, Frank Gotch would have been household and very well known names, so I think if we can think about um, the sketches and the sculptures we see in this exhibition, within this kind of wider visual culture, um, and, and quite frequent reporting um, of, of wrestling, I think that's useful for us to think about those intersections uh, too, and these are again just some of these uh, periodicals that I've mentioned um, depicting um, the, these um, fighters with wrestlers, Armored Bucks, uh, an Indian wrestler, greatly feared as well, and revered and feared, and there's lots of discussion at the time about imperial relationships as well. Crystal Palace in Sydenham was a great venue for wrestling matches, holding the Inter-Empire Games um, in 1911, and the wrestling was very widely reported on, um, and especially Bucks' strength um, and, and um, technique as well was very much um, discussed. As well, uh, in 1910, um, at the um, uh, Anglo-Japan exhibition in Shepherds, in, in Shepherds Bush as well, and so we have um, again this idea of a global, an interest in a global sport, and I think um, Gody Breshka was particularly interested in um, sumo uh, and, and fused these interests with his researches in places like the British Museum, looking at cultures, um, for Asian cultures of sport and um, physicality and encounter. I think as well as this sort of wider Edwardian landscape of a, of a wrestling revival, I think it's useful for us well to, to think about um, the avant-garde interest in boxing and fighting at this time. I'm just going to sort of show some examples to think about this sort of um, wider cultural um, and artistic aesthetic interest in um, combat sports, uh, which Lynn alluded to at this moment. William Roberts, particularly fascinated by uh, boxing, and did a series of work um, on the boxers and also sketches um, and drawings in watercolour um, in the gym, uh, sparring partners of 1919 and in the gymnasium of 1920. David Bomberg's work as well, this is Jiu Jitsu from the Tate of 1913. And again, I think you can, we can sort of draw some uh, relationships here between um, the sort of ab interest in the abstract form of patterns, of holds, of bodies in relationships, this tangle, these interlocking limbs and forms being um, explored by Bomberg in this painting. And Jenny, in her essay for the catalogue as well, talks very much about the relationship between um, combat and dance and movement at this time. And some commentators discussing new dances and new forms like the Apache dance as being akin to a fight. And that sort of relationship between dancing and the tussle, dancing and, and the grapple being conjured up um, in, in uh, works such as this one by Wyndham Lewis, Combat uh, Number no. 2. And I think bringing together Godier's um, own work here, Redstone Dancer of 1913, with the wrestler's relief. Again, I think we see these works in series or the relationships between them. And I've just sort of turned Redstone Dancer on its side here. Um, and I don't know whether you can see this very well um, on the PowerPoint. Um, but I think, again, that interest in the, the body movement and how, how an artist stills the body at a particular moment, dancing and wrestling, these, these ideas of when the body um, comes into moments of stasis in these incredible, incredibly visual um, and, and um, energetic encounters. So I think 
Godin's real interest in this um, tension, in the artistic potential between the juxtaposition between movement and stasis is something that we really can think about uh, with these uh, works bringing together, as uh, Jenny's done in this exhibition, dance and sport, uh, violence and movement. That's, those relationships really come out, I think, when we look at these works. I'm just going to throw some other images out there to you, into the, into the ring, onto the mat, uh, to use some relevant metaphors, just to think about that longer history of um, an artistic interest in wrestling. And I don't want to say too much about these works, I just wanted to sort of put these out there to you. Um, and I, I chose a Cambridge example um, of Rubens, Two Men Wrestling, from the Fitzwilliam. Um, these wonderful drawings by Millet and uh, William uh, Mulready, uh, drawn from the um, Pancrastini um, cast, which was at the Royal Academy Schools, which both artists drew from to gain access to draw from the life models during their academic training. So wrestling having, or the subject of wrestling, having this place within academic artistic training as well. William Etty's The Wrestlers, where this really all began for me. I worked on a show on William Etty at your Art gallery and started to think about the relationships between these wrestlers in um, Etty's life sketch as well. Coming into the 20th century, Francis Bacon, um, and this is uh, his two figures, with um, a page from Moy Bridges' uh, The Human Figure in Motion, taken from Bacon's studio, and you can see the paint splatters on that uh, page that he's used. And again, this really, I'm putting this out here, to really start a discussion, really, about thinking about physicality, sensuality, homoeroticism, and sexuality, which subjects and represent, representations of wrestling, I think, really ask us to think about um, Steve McQueen's uh, work there as well, thinking about uh, the ideas of race, violence, and homoeroticism. To go back to Godia as well, this incredible poster um, for black and white Scotch whiskey, I think, brings get to the fore some of those relationships between uh, physicality um, and race. And uh, this is an incredible thinking about that spectacle of the fight and the billboard. Um, here we have this advert for black and white um, Scotch whiskey. It's quite interesting. I think they originally, in the end, they went with the two Scotty dogs to advertise uh, this. So something that's quite different from what Godia was imagining. Um, imagining here. And so you can see here um, his words, this was a great fight, a black and white great fight, oh sorry, this was a great fight between black and white. Kind of actually gets you to do that movement there as I sort of skipped around um, around the, uh, the, 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 the page or the pages. It's a, it's a very interesting work, a composite um, work. And it's interesting to think about those intersections between modernism and, and, and sport here that Goji is um, exploring. Is he referring here to the 1910 fight uh, between Jack Johnson and James Jackson Jeffries the, the, uh, for the American heavyweight championship? Um, or perhaps um, in the next year in, in Britain, 1911, a much discussed and touted fight between Johnson and Bombardier Billy Wells, which was actually cancelled. So there was so much outcry about a fight between a black and a white boxer. Um, and, in, and interestingly, this actually brought in um, a, a colour bar in, in British boxing. Um, Winston Churchill actually brought uh, this bill um, in, and, and this led to the fight not only being cancelled, but a colour bar between uh, black and white fighters in Britain, which lasted till 1947. So it's interesting to see uh, Godio Brescia's 1911 poster within that context as well. Another uh, kettle yard um, piece um, to think about uh, Gurudji's interest in the physicality of uh, sport and of the, the fighters as well, and thinking about his role as a sculptor, um, an untrained sculptor having to train himself um, to work on sculpture. And these, um, he carved this knuckle duster for his friend, um, the rather pugnacious poet uh, T. E. Hume, um, and. Just put this photograph in of Godia carving himself, and he had the, he talked about having to build the strength to carve. And when he had to carve this, the head of Ezra Pound in marble, the actual kind of 
thinking about the, the strength that it took for him to, to complete a work of that scale. And actually, it's interesting then to think about the wrestlers in plaster and the sort of different kinds of relationships a, a, a carver and a sculptor would have in carving plaster and the, and the smooth forms, those kind of dancing forms that we have in, in the plaster, as opposed to... The, 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 the training, the, the physicality of, of carving into stone as well. So I think um, I'm going to, or we'll return, to, I'll leave um, the wrestler's relief on the screen. And um, hopefully that's just conjured some of that early 20th century um, idea of the wrestling revival and Gogi's fascination with this subject. Um, as you've probably, well, as you've heard, I'm an art historian by training. Um, and when I was thinking about um, what Gogi Breshka's relief can tell us about wrestling, and what wrestling can tell us about this relief, I realised that this was a, very much a collaborative project. This was about uh, physical and formal knowledge that, as an art historian, I didn't have. And, uh, but I know someone who does. So I'm going to hand over to Steve Fowler now. to be overshadowed in that way so I can try and regain your faith in me. <laughs> the original idea, I think, was maybe to do a little demonstration, and we decided against that for a few reasons. Um, I think the first reason would be we're surrounded by precious priceless subjects, and the other, when Jenny pinned me, it would perhaps undercut my authority somewhat, so to speak. <laughs> but anyway, what I decided to do is just speak about my background in wrestling, actually in my, my kind of life's career in wrestling, and then also about what's actually happening in what was once the, the relief there. So the actual technique that's being shown in the relief, because the little journey and collaboration between Sarah and I began when she was so kind to ask me to go and write some new work, knowing me really only as a poet with an interest in wrestling, not knowing how long my history in wrestling had been. And we got to go to the actual Tate stores, and I got to see it, and the first thing that I saw was the technique. I didn't see the motion, I didn't see the lines, I didn't see the entanglement of the bodies, I actually saw the very, very specific series and set of moves that led to that moment that he tried to capture. So it's, it's very much not an abstract moment happening, it's something really specific. But anyway, so my background really comes from my grandfather. My grandfather was a catch wrestler. And catch wrestling is a really specific form of wrestling, and it really leads on from some of the theories that Sarah was discussing. These massive shows that were so prominent in the, in the nation's mentality, and really on a global scale, started to be somewhat altered by promoters because they found that they were ending too quickly and people were getting a little bit infuriated. And what was happening was people were touring around these shows, especially in Depression era in America, and these wrestlers were having these very famous uh, welcome all comers type uh, engagements where they'd be fighting local farm boys or local toughs. And what happened because of that, in a variety of ways in the US and different countries too, is that the wrestlers had to develop something rather beyond the pinning mentality. They had to develop a rather savage form of wrestling. And that's something that really veered off from the other more traditional forms of the sport, like amateur wrestling as we know, Olympic wrestling, Greco-Roman and freestyle. My grandfather was, was a minor, and the minors took up this wrestling sport because they didn't want to hurt their hands. They didn't want to be involved in pugilism. So really the art of catch developed because they wanted to compete in a savage way against each other, very, very tough men, but without having that damage to their bodies. And so there was a bit of a split. And what started to happen is, is the best of those people started to tour around and welcome all comers. The promoter started to ask them to slow it down, draw him out, get the audience involved, get them thinking that the local man's going to win and then beat him. This is the origins of professional wrestling, unfortunately. So my, my grandfather taught my father, who taught my brother, who taught me. Um, and I spent really all my youth, I had no creative background at all, wrestling at over 200 matches in amateur, Greco, catch and submission. And then I was a professional martial artist for about three years using wrestling against other styles. Because we're in a golden age of wrestling right now, in fact, the biggest since 100 years ago, because of mixed martial arts. You might have heard of the Ultimate Fighting Championship and the awful cage fighting names it's given. In fact, it's just a competition pitting different martial arts against each other. And it's evolved into this sport where wrestling is the primary sport. 
And this was a beautiful thing for me as a man growing up and competing early on in MMA, because wrestling is the ugly duckling art. We've forgotten about it. It's one of our indigenous arts. And we started to just love Eastern mystical martial arts in the 70s because of kung fu fighting and things like that. Wrestling is dirty, it's ugly. You can't really see the technique unless you really know the techniques there. It just looks like two men hugging. Whereas in fact, it's incredibly devastating, incredibly effective, smothering martial art. So kind of that's the background that I came up into doing these things and in my mid-twenties started to write and started to do artworks and then found myself doing this wonderful project with Sarah. So what I thought I'd do is I'll just talk you through the actual stages of the still not that wrestling. But that's fine, you remember what it looks like. One of the primary techniques of wrestling that especially works against people who aren't other wrestlers is to do something called a double leg takedown. And what that means essentially is it looks very much like a rugby tackle. Um, and a <laughs> there we are. So it looks very much like a rugby tackle, in the sense that this wrestler here is trying to grip the legs of this wrestler. The difference between a rugby tackle and a double leg takedown is one in spine position. The way you generate force in wrestling and the way you cover ground is radically different than a rugby tackle, for a variety of reasons, one being that rugby players are holding the ball. But essentially the point is, if you imagine the two men standing like so, a rugby tackle, the people bend at the waist and lean over. What this means in terms of wrestling there are a very simple defense called a sprawl, where you drive your hips down on top of someone. And if you're bent over as you do so, there's a finite point that you can keep moving before you hit the ground. So when you try and rugby tackle someone, if they drop their hips down, your head hits, and it stops. And that person who you try to take down will be able to stop you. So in wrestling, what we do is we change levels early. So instead of our spines moving at this angle, with a finishing point, an event horizon, we change levels and we point our spines up. So as you hit the person's hips, even if they hip in, you're always underneath them. What's essentially happened here is the wrestler here on the right has shot a double leg takedown in against this wrestler here, who's hipped out to stop his legs being pulled out from underneath him and having his back flattened to the floor. In doing so, the wrestler on the bottom has had to adjust his technique because he can't simply shovel the legs out in front of him. And what often happens in wrestling, one of the phrases that I teach children and every, all coaches teach children is two becomes one, one becomes two. When you can't get two legs, you switch the angle, maybe 30 degrees, and you grab one leg, the leg that's closest to your head, because that's where all your force is going, because your spine is facing up. What's happened here is this wrestler who's been sprawled upon, has been stopped in the double leg, has switched to a single leg. What this means is now that he's trying to do a technique called running the pipe which is about the fact that the human knee only moves in one direction, something we forget in daily life, but it is the truth. So when you pick up the single leg like so, and you turn it sideways, the hip whips around in this direction, and you end up on your back. And when someone does that to you, they've picked up one of your legs, and they...